Welcome back everyone to week four of Your Unique Something. Uh, we're going to be doing things slightly different today. First thing you'll note is that our microphone has malfunctioned, so we're just using the camera's mic and hopefully the quality doesn't suffer too dramatically for that. Next week we should be able to replicate that and hopefully from the following weeks it won't be an issue. Um, also slightly different today is that we have two guests on with us. Um, we have got Jake Dean and his partner Madison Rogers. Uh, I, I've known these two for a couple of years now, full disclosure. They're pretty decent friends of mine. And uh, Jake is a second year apprentice baker, as well as a guitarist. Yeah. Yeah. How, how far into, are you into your um, currently, career? Currently, just I've been self taught since the beginning. So at the beginning, it was kind of like, oh, I want to learn like the intro to, I don't know, like Enter Sandman as an example. And then I, like, yeah, cool, learned intro, next song. So, um, I still feel I need to do a bit of like constructive learning and all that sort of stuff and a bit more scale, scale stuff. But other than that, you know, I, I think I'm all right. I've been playing for six and a half years now. Yeah. And, and um, um, we'll, we'll have a little bit of him playing at the end of the video. And uh, Madison. Madison here is, has a diploma in deportment and modeling. And, um, deportment. Yes. Very weird word. It is a very weird word. <laughs> Alright, can, can you explain what deportment and modeling exactly means in this context? So, deportment and modeling, it's how you hold yourself, how, it's et basically etiquette in a sense. Yeah. So, in the course, you learn how to you know, obviously like hold an item before, which like what to use. It's very much how to be proper. Mm. That would be the best way to describe so, the course. So, so how to act in a, a appropriate and proper manner. Yeah. All right. Does that stretch to how you talk and communicate as well? Or is it strictly how you move and act? It's a mix. So if I'm talking on the phone, I will def I will definitely open my mouth more if I talk over. Yeah. A uh, PA microphone. I'll definitely open my mouth more, and I'll use my. I'll talk more. I don't know how I would describe it. I would talk a lot more in a proper tone with friends. I would talk more casually, but it's more. It's yeah. Basically, you learn how to talk properly, and you. It's a. It's, you can apply it in everyday scenario. It's yeah. like through work and through friends and doing everyday everyday activities. Oh, right. Alright, so just to quickly backtrack for the people who aren't familiar, um, Your Unique Something is a weekly podcast that goes live every Saturday. Uh, it, it's basically, I bring people in and they give their unique experience, perspectives, whatever, on whatever topic they want to talk about. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the Australian music industry, since these two are both very, very uh, passionate about it all. Um, now, Jake, I, I know that we were talking prior to recording this, and that you were... You mentioned that you don't get to play as much as you want to because you're working. Exactly how much do you work a week? Um, so it can fluctuate uh, depending on how heavy the workload is that week or how much product we actually have to make. Um, so I think when I was like earlier on in my night shifts, it would be like maybe 40, 50 hours, and then now it's sort of gone down to about 38, 45. Yeah. So you went from <clears throat> spending most of the week working to just kind of mm. having maybe a couple of days off to just. Yeah, so I used to do five days a week and two days off, your standard sort of full-time job, but now it's only four days a week and I get three days off, which is really good. I, I love it so much. Well, thank you for giving one of uh, an hour of your time for this day. Um, and Madison, I believe you have two jobs currently. I, I do. I work in retail. I work at Big Dobby, which is a department store, and I also work at EB Games, yeah. which is um, a game store. Well, what's that like? Which of the two jobs do you find you enjoy more in your, your interaction with customers? I find that I enjoy EB Games a lot more, considering it's more personal, rather than Big W, it's more, you get your things and you go, you serve the person and they go, you don't yeah. get the intimacy of interaction and learning what people like and being able to have a genuine conversation and immerse yourself in a, in a gaming culture, you yeah. don't get that... It's that strictly learning. business. Yeah, it's, it's strictly business, but yeah. it still is at EB Games, but you get that... Well, e e EB Games, for those who aren't familiar, has a very much a motto of they sell you the relationship, not the product. But you get the product from them, but you, you come in there and you go to EB Games in particular because you like EB Games. Exactly. So you would... Yeah, what we sort of represent, we represent 
the, the culture and people come in for the culture. If you wanted to just buy a game and go, you'd go to Big W. But if yeah. you wanted to learn about what's coming out, what's what's happening in, in the game you're about to buy, mm. and you know, make friends and as well as just get an opinion. Yeah, yeah. You get, yeah. get an opinion. Yeah. You'd go so to Big Games. Maybe we'll stop advertising for EB Games right now. <laughs> Alright, so um, you, you guys actually very specifically chose the topic this week, so I was just hoping you guys could give us a brief overview of the, the topic, and why did you pick it? Um, well, music's always been sort of like a big part of my life. Um, I think I like discovered my, my sister's metal collection when I was in like grade 7, and from then on it just sort of snowballed into this thing where it's a lot of what I listen to now, but I listen to like sort of like some punk bands, like Friends of Rome and Bit of blink here and there, but I predominantly focus on listening to metal, and yeah. you know I picked up um, from just friends at school and just people around me, like new bands that some that I might not have even heard of, and it's just awesome hearing about just even if they're like American or British or anything. Like I remember listening to Bullet My Valentine for the first time, and it blew my mind. Fair enough. And uh, Matt, can you? Is there any particular reason why you're interested in this topic as well, or do you just really want to talk about it? I obviously want to talk about it, but it's a matter of the fact I've been into it for a long time as well, since obviously growing up you hear music, it's a part of being human, is, that's part of culture, but yeah. at the same time growing up. At, like, at, a certain, like, at a certain time we had like All Star, which is you know cable TV. Yeah, and yeah. we had a music channel and I would just put it on and I would just have it in the background and I'd be interested, I'd be like, who's this artist, what are they about, and I'd research it and it'd be like an eclectic range, it would yeah. just be a certain genre. Yeah. Right. So I'd, I'd listen to multiple artists as well. Alright, just, just to throw out the disclaimer, you might hear a bit of um, surround sound in the area, we are doing this in my parents' house, just a bit more of a casual setting, a bit more relaxed. Maybe in the future we'll move to a studio, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> down the line. Um, but I, I know that before you, you were talking that about how it's very very hard to get into the Australian music industry. Mm. Um, so for those who don't know, like even getting into the music industry in general is um, a challenge within itself. You have to. Uh, Phil and Salmo did like a video on tips for the starting bits. He was like, you know, make sure you have like a solid base. Yeah. Like, you know, you practice for like eight months before you even go into a studio, so that you know what you're doing. But he also said, you know, like, gig for free and just gig your ass up, basically. Yeah. And um, so that you get that exposure. And he, said, and he said one big advantage that bands have nowadays is stuff like, you know, Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. So you, can, you have a much, much wider you reach can, than ever yeah, before. Yeah, you, you can reach a lot more people. Yeah. Uh, is this particularly hard in Australia or is it... Um, like, it depends on the scene. Like, I mean, you don't hear too many Australian artists sort of coming out. Um, because we're usually oversalted by American artists and yeah. British artists, and you know, you, you sort of I, I stumble onto a lot of Aussie bands. So I'm like, oh, okay, hello, how's it going? And it's pretty great, and, and you enjoy it, and you went, well, yeah, this is really good. Yeah, like in Hans Wake, they dropped their first album in I think it was like 20, I mean like 2012 or 2014. It was like around that that time, and I um first time I listened to them, I was just like, man, these guys are like hard way, and I was like, they're going to be big. And they took Newcomer of the Year uh, from North Lane, which is another Aussie band, and they just... That's cool. Sweet. Alright, so just, just quickly, warning, because um, Jake's speaking very, very eloquently right now. He does have a bit of a penchant for swearing, like Dylan Ham did last week. Um, Dylan Ham managed to hold out the entire show. I don't actually expect people to, so if he swears a bit, just I uh, apologise for that, and you might want to turn it down a little bit if you're opposed to it. Fair enough. Um, Maddie, do you have anything to add on to what Jake said, or...? Like, I, I agree, like, it is very difficult for Australian artists to get out there with... Like, if you do see band, like, bands on the radio, that's very... It's more local bands and indie bands, and... It, you don't really see many, be like, big, like, Americanized sort of bands coming out of yeah. Australia. You see you, you don't, little... You, you don't really bands. hit that scale that America hits, which just this worldwide reach. Mm. I feel like it's all, it's always very homegrown stuff. Like I know there's artists that have that have sort of hit it big in the alternate industry, like Flume. He's a artist. He makes like like dance music and things like that. He's, he's he's sort of gaining like popularity as time goes on. He was originally Australian and he's gaining a bit of traction in America. Yeah. 
but you don't see many big pop artists coming out like pop rock. It's more more Americanized, and that's yeah. that's yeah. a big like a big thing in Australia. There's not much We're, Australian. We don't have the same exposure yeah. even in our own yeah. country. Um, just to quickly cover this, can I just get you guys to both elaborate on your, your own tastes in music and your own feelings on everything? So, um, my taste varies from many things. Um, I'm mainly into a lot of metal these days, I like the artist motor shirt. Um, they're an Aussie band as well, funnily enough. Um, bands like Infinite Annihilator, which British band, they're pretty, pretty good, cool, excellent. Won't lie. Um, bit, bit on the brutal side. Um, there's another new band, uh, Primordial. They were really good too. I I saw them on a deathcore memes page. It had their album cover, and it just said that feel when it still explores no, uh, more planets than No Man's Sky. And they had an excellent soundscape. Um, Bring Me the Horizon, uh, North Lane. Yeah. Um, List goes just on and on and yeah. on and on and on. So we'll move on to Madison. <laughs> Madison, can you elaborate on your, your taste in music? Can I have a very like broad taste in music, I feel. I I'm always willing to explore artists and what they can bring to the table. Yeah. I I don't have much pre prejudice in the way of enjoying a good artist. So I'll listen to metal like metal, rock, dubstep, electronic music. I like I'll listen to a bit of pop music and I'll definitely enjoy it. I enjoy a good artist that can produce a qual like a quality sound yeah. and can can deliver. I, I I definitely enjoy the majority of genres that have like any artist has to offer. Yeah, fair enough. Um now, have you guys ever tried to get into the music scene at all or not really? Um I mean I've I audition I well didn't Audition, but I um, got to play with the one RAR band up in Townsville, which is the military band. Yeah. Um, I played with them for I think it was like three days. The first day was just a sports day that yeah. um, they had, but that's the only real sort of attempt I've had at trying to get into music business. And um, I kind of just I ended up going there and I played bass for eight hours, and that was straining. And I just thought, maybe just for me, just quickly yeah. uh, verify what what instruments do you play? Um, I play bass guitar and guitar, um, and I I played trombone in high school as well for two years. Fair enough. Um, all right, so we'll have Jake play a little bit at the end of the, the podcast today. Um, if you want, you can skip ahead. I'll put it down in the description uh, when it starts. Uh, Madison, you ever tried to get into the music industry, or was it not quite for you? It's not quite for me. I feel like definitely taking like taking pic like pictures, like photography, and doing reviews, like journalism. Yeah. That would be more my thing. Like in so high school, I'd be I've a done musical that. journalist. Yeah, more of a musical journalist. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, in that case, I, I may try and bring you on when I actually do start talking to uh, different Australian bands down the line. If you're interested in coming on, asking questions. That sounds good. Good stuff. All right. So with that, we'll, we'll move into the first. Uh, first major area, which is the, the prominent genres and scenes in Australia. So um, I, I know that, Jake, you just mentioned that you're quite a, a big metal fan. Yeah. Australia actually has a, a quite large metal community, doesn't it? It does. Um, I remember one time having a band come to my high school, and um, their guitarist actually said that his favourite shows to go to were like underground shows, because like Australia's underground metal scene is just huge. Like, it's ridiculous, like, um, and especially, like, just our metal scene in general, like, we had Soundwave, but that got canned, so... Yeah, what, what, why did Soundwave get canned? Can you... Um, <laughs> artists not getting paid, like, I think Slipknot was still owed, like... They were owed over a million dollars. Yeah, a phenomenal million. amount, yeah. And I think Disturbed is still owed, even though they never went, they were promised, um, half a million, I believe it was? And then, um... And that was meant to come from like ticket sales and stuff. Like this was, yeah, this was in, uh, I think it was like late 2015 that it got cancelled uh, for next year. And um, I think they'd already done pre-sales for tickets, but they didn't refund anyone. Oh no. Um, it was a very shady business. So you know, dick move on. I can't even remember what his name is because 
Yeah, but, sorry, um, but no, it was it wasn't it was mismanaged, very yeah. very dramatically so. And so, yeah. what uh, what happened from that was a couple people said, well, fuck it, we'll do our own music festival, and they called it Legion. Legion. Um, is that still going on? Yeah. So the way that it worked was it was a crowdfunded festival. Yeah. Um, it didn't end up happening uh, this year because it was such a short time scale and uh, some bands were a bit sort of like a bit iffy yeah. on whether they should actually come to Australia or not. But um, it's happening next year, I believe, and it's uh, depending on how much money gets donated to them is what artists they can actually get. Well, that's quite a clever way of running things, actually. Mm. So, and like if you donate a certain amount of money, you get uh, certain perks like tickets and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Um, yeah, and but how do you feel about uh, Legion? Do you? I think it's a smart idea. It's it's commu completely community focused, and it's a good way for like a com like the metal community to definitely say like we want this band. We want this festival. We want to do this today. We like we like this idea. It's more instead of someone saying, "Well, tough crap. You can't you can't get this artist in. It's all organised by me. You have to pay this much for these amount of tickets, and it's only for yeah, one day." It's, it's much more. There's, it's, there's communication there. There's a there's a discussion. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That, that's good to hear, actually. Um, so, do you guys think that like the the Australian attitude? We have this the stereotype of being very camaraderie, you know. Brothers in arms, you're either with us or against us kind of yeah. attitude. Do you think that That's helps? That's one though? way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very polite way of saying yeah. it. Um, um, I, I honestly do think that has a big sort of um, play on uh, some metal bands, not all. Yeah. Um, I mean, Dead Kelly, a uh, great example of a all Aussie band that, you know, they chill out in like footy shorts and singlets and they just launch videos on Australia Day and they are completely like independent at the moment. They're bringing out an album next year called Australian Made and it's got like a kangaroo on the front of it. Um, very, very, uh, can't think of the term is. Aussie? <laughs> no, not what I meant, but yeah, Aussie. It's very, very Aussie. It's um, and very patriotic kind of thing. In, and I think in like one of their videos they're doing like an announcement and it's it's like the singer like with this microphone on a on a bin. On just on just a bin and he's talking and then he's got like the other band members like standing next to him. And then like some baby cries and he's just like, oh fuck, like shit. <laughs> uh, again, warning, Jake swears like a trooper. And yeah, like they just like, they assert themselves, they just quote themselves as a band that just doesn't care. They just yeah. don't give a shit. Like they, and they perpetuate that in their music. Like they have a, they have a song called Red Tirana, which Red Tirana. Um, but Tirana is, uh, for those who don't know, is a car made by Holden that was very, very, very popular in Australia. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then you know they have another song called Bushfire. <laughs> Their EP that, is titled Bushfire. That must hit home for a lot of New South Wales. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh man. And, um, and, and that's it. Uh, yeah, any, I've, I've actually slightly lost what we're talking about right now. I know we're talking about just Australian. festivals and artists. Yeah. Just just Australian artists that you can think of. Metal artists in particular right now. I know we went and saw In Hot's Wait there in Slipknot. Yeah. And they were, ve they were very definitely organic and very true. Like when they went on stage like, you know, what, like, what a wonderful day to be alive, you know, I want to see like everyone here, like we're all, we're all together, we're brothers and sisters in arms, we're all like earth walkers and they've always, they look, they definitely look like Parkway Drive, they're very true and mm -hmm. they're very, I thought that's definitely a, a, a good Australian trait in most artists. Yeah, and it's crazy too, like now that I think of it, um, In Hearts Wake, Parkway and Thyotis Murder off like three big other names, they decently give a shit about the environment. Like, that's, I think, Parkway's album, Atlas, has like a couple songs that relate to like, um, the Earth's destruction through human pollution and all that sort of stuff. Um, in Hunt's Way, they have an album, Earth War Girl. Yeah. Self-explanatory. And, um, Thought I Was Murder, Holy Wolf, um, that has a couple songs on there that are uh, to do with uh, polar bears having to migrate and... 
Yeah, tooth and claw. Yeah. And yeah. <clears throat> Alright, so we'll, we'll start moving past this. Um, I know that Jake's given me warning ahead of time that he's not that knowledgeable with this, but I'll, I'll still talk about it with Madison. The presence of country music in Australia, I, I know it has quite a large presence here as well. It, it does, definitely in country places like sort of more towards like central Queensland and more towards like the more arid regions. It's very, it's obviously the same as American country music, but it's more Austral Australian centric. Like yeah. definitely like going to the outback, putting my boots in the dust. And I know that uh, kangaroos and stuff like that. And we have a tendency to get a bit, bit, a bit more satirical with our. Yeah, like, definitely. It's more like more comedic. We've always been lighthearted people, and that shows definitely in country music. Yeah. I I feel and like my mum, she's a massive fan of country music, and now that she lives further further north, she like, she enjoys country music, and they play it all the time. She works in a she works in a pub. Nothing wrong with enjoying country music. No, yeah. def definitely not. It's uh, it's Australian country music. It's definitely its own in its own element. It's yeah. still, it's, it's still a, like you know, es essentially country. Uh, can I what do you guys think of any big country bands in Australia or, or country singers? No, not off the top of my head. All, all I've got like stuck in my head, stuck in my head right now is that I heard a country song. I don't know if it's Aussie or if it's um, like anything else, but um. It's a song, I have no idea who it's by, but all I know is that it's called You Put the Country. Alright, fair enough. I think there's yep. a. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I think it's Kenny Rogers or something like that. Or Kenny something, Rogers. Si something similar to that, I believe. I'll find it and put it in the description. Just I think my mom, my mom was a big fan of him. Yeah, but you were saying that um, Australian music is very. Country music is very distinct. It's, it's very distinct. We have our own little niche in the country music field. It's not as popular in, I don't believe it's popular here as it is in America. Like, it's very, like, exactly like American music, it's very patriotic. Yeah. But at the same time, it's very light-hearted and almost comedic in a sense. But you still get that country element of um, going out to the out, out there, yeah, going to walk in the bush. There's a genuine love for the country yeah. in, in the music itself. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Fair enough. It's, it's it's very enjoyable. Country music does have its own nice nice feeling to it, sure. um, and, and we'll probably move into one that most viewers and even will be most familiar with just from growing up. Um, pop music in Australia, specifically American pop music in, in our industry. So we, we do have our own pop artists, but as far as I understand, they don't ever quite get the same yeah, same radio. Presence. I was about to say they don't get the same push on radio as um, American artists do, uh, whether it's to do with money or what have you. Like yeah. I don't know. But um, because my boss was telling me they've actually they have a formula of how to make a popular song yeah. within a certain number of like they have like basically an algorithm to make a popular song. Uh, this is mentioned by um, our common band, but the four chords. The four chords song, yeah. Yeah, four chords. Yes. And Axis of Awesome. Yeah, there it is. And yeah, that's. Um, I feel like that would probably have a big part to play with like all pop music across the spectrum, yeah. but you know, they just, yeah, you get a lot of American artists and just, you, you don't hear too much Australian on the radio unless you're listening to like Triple J. Yeah, fair enough. Little fun facts for you, um, Uptown Funk, it was made by Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars, doesn't have a chorus, has a bridge, no chorus. Oh. They specifically made it to sit outside of the norms. The entire song sits outside of the norms of what a conventional pop song should be. That's really, really neat actually. Yeah, they they spent a lot of time and a lot of hours actually making it and it, it paid off, it definitely paid off. I, I, I definitely recommend then, like, that's just a good message to everyone out there who wants to write a pop song. Don't stay in the box, go out and do whatever you want, just just experiment, have, have fun. But say you stay in the box, you get forgotten very quickly. Yeah, definitely. But do you think there's any um, notable difference the, between the Australian music industry and the American music industry when it comes to pop singers or accents? Yeah, accents like, even though people. like artists usually they don't have a prominent accent unless it's, unless they say like, oh that sounds good, like the recording company will say yeah. keep that. Because some artists that aren't particularly American have American accents, but when you sing, the whole idea, like, I've been in a choir before, the whole idea is to get rid of an accent yeah. and produce a, a neutral... Clean. Yeah, a clean sound that could have... You know, it's, an ambiguous origins. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it's it's definitely a lot to do with I feel with the all like the artists, the money, and who owns what radio yeah. station and the, 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 what can be put on TV and what can't be put on TV. Yeah, there's also something worth noting here that um I'll, I'll throw up there because I know about this from um, studying it. Um, I know that in Australia we have this certain th there are certain Australian accents we don't want to put on the radio or put on TV like that. That's that's why the majority of the world seems to think we only have the one accent. There is one particular accent we like to show people, and we don't really like to expose the others. So if you have a very broad Australian accent or a very heavy one, we tend to either force you to get rid of it, or we won't push you very hard. And that's probably worth knowing, whereas an American accent can actually take you quite far, even outside of America. So that, that, that's probably something that's worth knowing. We, we have much more of a, uh, we don't like to hear our own accent, really. Convict accent. So it's, it's it's a butcher version of the English accent, yeah. which is curious. And if you go to North London, you get a lot of people who sound a lot like us. So there you go. There you go. Very very interesting. Um, all right, and, and I know that you guys, you brought this up when I was talking about the podcast. Um, how the other countries view Australian musicians? I know that was a big one for you both, so we'll start with Madison. I think we shy away from Australian music, and but I think particularly if a recording company finds an artist appealing, like aesthetically, they will definitely invest some time and money to, to try and make them popular. Yeah. I like I found Iggy Azalea. She definitely got a lot of music. She definitely put a lot of music out, but she got a lot of money and advertising put behind her, and. Yeah. The issue was she tried to play this like Amer like American like African American sort of girl like she was still white yeah. and Australian but she tried to play this African American yeah, she, she accent did, off yeah she did try to play um, for lack of a better term black girl yeah that would be it. Like, she definitely like like appropriated that that culture I yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to say that because it's a term that's overused but she definitely appropriated yeah she definitely I, I, appropriated. I um, and it, look, it, it definitely went south for her because she tried, you know, doing like sell out concerts in big arenas around America and Australia and it blocked. Yeah. And her career went down, down the drain and she doesn't really produce music anymore. She's on things like X Factor as a judge, but that's pretty much yeah, where she her, ends. Her career did go downhill. Mm -hmm. On the topic of Iggy, we'll, uh, we'll move into the next segment, which is uh, prominent figures in the Australian music industry and their effects. On the music industry, um, so so we'll just quickly. Uh, I just want to. I know that certain um, artists get very very big in Europe when it comes to Australia. We have a very large presence in European mm. um, radio. So, do you guys think there's any particular reason for that, or or why why is Europe so much more welcoming towards us than America is? I, I think we have a, they have a fascination with us as a fair. as a place, like in. England. I'm sure Home and Away is a big show because yeah. you see the beach and you see the sunshine. And there's also um, there's what what is it? Uh, there's a fascination. Neighbors. Yeah, or something. No, not neighbors. There's a there's a movie that they had come out while I was over there. That's like um, a group of um, you know proper English chavs come to Australia and uh, in, get in, in, in between. In yeah, the in between is too. Like the entire thing is just like them coming to Australia and getting around so much and having this, this really stereotypically. Time. Yeah, Aussie time. Aussie time. It was just they, they, there's definitely that fascination there, and I know that while I was there, um, with one of my other English or um, Aussie friends, Wade, um, we, we there was certainly a lot of fascination around our accent and our culture and how we had this. First off, um, we are very willing to fight. <laughs> um, that was something that I only became aware of when I went to England because I I don't particularly like to fight, and I'm Australian, but um, I won't shy away from it and. That's a very unusual thing in England. <laughs> um, and that, that comes through in our music, I think, as well. We're, we're, we're very passionate. We're very aggressive as well. Yeah, we, um, once again, I have to um, throw back to The Artist Murder. They, um, yeah. They've got a couple, like, couple of interviews on YouTube and stuff of um, them in Europe. And they like exploded in Europe and America and not so much in Australia. And they, it's a bit weird for them, like it's you know, an Aussie band, and they tour Australia every now and then, and all that odd stuff. But um, yeah. they said that they get particularly good treatment in Europe. Um, they'll like they'll be out in the night having a drink or whatever, and go in bars, and people are like, oh, what, what are you like? What, what's your job like in Australia? Like, what do you do? And then he's like, 
I think CJ, their old vocalist, said that they almost get treated like exotic animals. Mm. And he's like, oh man, my job back at home is to um, catch the kangaroos and, uh, you know, <laughs> put them in the zoos and all that sort of stuff. And they're like, oh, really? Like, full on believing him. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, totally, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I, I feel like Australians just in general have, like, the, the shenanigan vibe about them. Well, I, I think it's definitely because we do have a, um, a, a no bullshit. Yeah, you know, oh, definitely. Way of going about things. That that's very much our culture at the moment. But we still like to have fun. Oh yeah, we, we love to have fun. <laughs> no, no bullshit means don't mess with me. Like don't, don't yeah, play yeah. games. Doesn't mean let's not go out and get pissed. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. All right. So that kind of addresses our popularity across the different air, um, industries. But for example, um, just to bring up this example, the Veronicas took off big time in England, um, weren't actually as big in Australia as they were in England, as it turns out, um, and they didn't quite get that same presence in America either. Do, do you have any any thoughts on that at all? I think that links back to the fascination with Australia and they have, well, England and Europe have with Australia, like oh, the Veronica's, they're sort of pop, but they have a pop punk vibe, like they're very pale and have black hair, so there's a sort yeah. of, rel- like, English that, people that can relate to a gothic, gothic relation yeah. to that, and I believe it was like 2005 and 2006 where that sort of emo pop punk era sort of took off a bit more. It just not happened. It sort of yeah more happened and went up went up, and that was sort of fitting between pop punk, but pop enough to be popular on the general radio, but punk enough for people from that people who enjoy that genre to listen to, which is I think was why it took off. Definitely right to Fair Um I'm trying to think. I, I guess another big one um, that I can think of is Sia. And, and Sia, I know, hit the number, um, hit the charts in America big time fairly recently, but had a bit of trouble starting off in America. And I know that they're, 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 well, she is a very, very big singer in um, yeah, sure. England. So do you have any thoughts on why Sia was able to quite, quite hit that right note? I think she established herself. She definitely took like took root in Australia and she did that very successfully as it's sort of more of an indie pop artist. And she had a few she had a few hits and she's more of a songwriter and she made song songs for big artists like Beyonce and Rihanna and that definitely like definitely shows she kept, you know, record of all of those songs and she made all of those songs that they didn't want to sing into an album and it's extremely successful. And she um, has the, the but, vocal range. But what do you think kind of limited her at the start? Or, or do you not know why, what, what? I feel like it was just Australia in general. They didn't... Well, like, I, I followed her from the start. I remember seeing her like, on music music channels and she would sing and it would be amazing. It would be breathtaking. Yeah. But the issue was she was stuck in that, in that hole, in that little box of being an indie singer and couldn't make the jump from Australian like Australian famous to American famous and becoming a songwriter take, sort of taking a step back from the spotlight for her because she had I believe she has a, a is a disease of some sort where like her like skin becomes discolored and yeah. she like misconstrues her face but that's definitely a part that's a part of her image as well as a singer yeah but did you- do you think that Sia's had a bit of an effect on her home country? Like, has our music industry changed anything from her, changed at all from her influence, you think? I, I think it has to a degree. I feel mm-hmm. like she sort of brought through a new wave of pop music and people giving Astra- Australians a chance in the pop music yeah. industry, definitely. There, like, there's, there's a bit more respect for us now. Yeah, like Five Seconds of Summer. They're like a pop male, pop rock band. Yeah, they're, 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 they're the other ones who, um, who are quite... Who jumped up there on the charts of uh, Sia, didn't they? Yeah, they popped up and they definitely followed on that wave and they became really successful in America rather than Australia. I feel like it flowed from like America to Australia and they did, they did a good job with that. Mm-hmm. I, well, for I respect for a very long time I actually thought that Five Seconds of Summer was actually an American band just because I knew of their huge presence there and, and they didn't really get that same level here. But that one, from what I've heard, uh, very much comes down to how they interact with their fans. Um, so I, I, I don't want to really talk crap, but I've heard that they're, they're not the most respectful band in the world. They're, they're kind of problematic in the sense that they'll 
pick and choose fans and get their numbers and things like that, but they'll pick their conventionally pretty fans mm. and they'll like be all over them and give them hugs and kisses and invite them backstage, so even the ones that haven't paid for that Yeah, they're, they're, they're a little bit of a, they womanize a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're in their, they're in their late teenagers, early 20s, so they yeah, can get so away with that. And, and obviously, and that's, that's fairly obviously hard they're, course, that Yeah, age. obviously they're diehard fans, they want to be next to them. They're like, oh my god, like, you know, Elite Singer's kissing me right now, this is amazing. And yeah. it sucks for the girls that are, aren't conventionally pretty for them to just, you know, get an you know, arm around the shoulder, have a picture, and they go, and their friend gets invited backstage, and they get their numbers, and get kisses and hugs. Uh, can you? I, I know you mentioned Iggy Azalea before, and that um, there was a lot of money put in there, and there was a lot of effort to make her. In my opinion, I thought they very much aimed to make her sound American mm. in terms of how her music went, how she sang, and uh, and do you have any other thoughts on her? Or? I feel I feel like with the investment that Americans put into her, like the American music industry put into her, the. Like Americans, they picked they picked up on it, especially African Americans. They picked up on how she tried to sound like them, how she tried to be like them, and they basically tore it shreds. Yeah. And when she sung live, she didn't sing at all. She basically slurred her words, and that also became a meme. Like she became a pretty much a living meme. She was ri like ridiculous. And for credit to her for trying to get out there, but. The industry that she was picked up from, like the, the rap industry, they, they definitely they, didn't... they weren't welcoming of someone who was just trying to... Yeah, to they just wanted her. to make her into this, like, you know... It's, it's a little bit like the American music industry tried to claim her, yeah. and that attempt went really, really sour really, really mm. quickly. I can understand that one. Um, and this is one that I'm going to bring up first, because I find it really, really funny, but... um. I understand that the Wiggles have kind of picked up as a, yeah. one of the highest earning bands in Australia recently because they're, they're doing 18 plus shows. Yeah, it's a, it's a smart move. It's definitely a smart move. I, I just think it's brilliant. It's, it's really... I think, I think too, it's, they're sort of now at that age where the 18 plus audience is the audience that, that, that grew up with listening that. to them. Yeah. So, um, I mean, fucking props to them. Like, yeah, that is awesome. 100% props to them. I, I wish more more bands had that kind of background to them when they went off to go into like a, a rerun. But I just, I mean, I'd have to see like one of their live shows to be like, hey, like to, I wonder if they throw in like more like adult themed songs for that, the pub was, show because that would be quite hilarious. Yeah, that was my immediate thought when I heard 18 plus only Wiggle show. Was just it's like they're not them playing. going wake up Greg and Greg turning around and going Fuck off. Like it, I feel like they might be like they'd still be like the Wiggles, but it's like a different side of the Wiggles. Yeah, it, it's the Wiggles grounded in a bit more Australian reality. Yeah, which yeah. I think that's that it is pretty funny. Like, did did you have any other thoughts on the Wiggles, Madison, or are we okay to move on to? Um, I think I think we're pretty good. Another, like another few artists that I do like do want to mention like on a side yeah. like on a side note yeah, is yeah. like Austra Australian rappers right relating back to Iggy Azalea. Yeah. Australian rappers don't take off because they have that ochre Australian accent that yeah. stereotypical accent. Yeah. Like like Bliss and Essa on 360 Day. They're very rough, and I feel like only Australians can listen to Australian rap, and they've also. Like I believe it was Bliss and Essa, they got in a bit of they caught a bit of flack. Um, I think it was earlier this year or last year where the lead singer said a racist or a sexist comment and uh, Triple J refused to play any of their music until he apologized. Uh, what what was that singer's name? Uh, it was I think it was the one with the last name Esso. I cannot remember for the life of me. Uh, I'll try and find it and put it in the description down below just so that viewers can have a look at that, but but yeah, I find, I find partic that's a very particular genre as well, the Australian rap. Yeah. It's very much its own niche thing, but Australian rappers don't... They don't come close to American rappers in yeah. popularity. And I also think part of that is that um, a, lo a large element of rap, and this is just from my own experience and exposure to it, is that um, it, you kind of have to own what you are. Like part of the reason why Eminem quite picked up like he did, and why all the others did, is because they owned who they were and what they were doing and who they, just just everything. And 
Australian rappers, from my experience, kind of try and emulate the American style of rap have kind of gone off on our own tree and just really grasp, you know, what makes an Australian an Australian. Like, um, there's, from like, ages ago, I don't even know what year the song, uh, song was, but it's by a group called Butterfingers. Butterfingers. And the song's called I Love Work. It's about, it's a Aussie group about how this guy, he goes to his, you know, his 9 to 5 job, whatever, and he's running late in the morning. And, um, but they still give a very sort of Australian perspective on it. So it's like, yeah. um, oh, what is it? It's like, um, uh, it's like, um, put, put, on, put on my shorts, scratch my nut, um, put on my shoes, strap them up. And it's like, and then I'm out the door and I'm in the street. And it's, and then he's like, he's speeding to work. And he's and he gets pulled over by a copper, like, not, not cop, but copper. Yeah. And he, um and he says um, but he's happy, just giving me a ticket. When he pisses off, I'm gonna flip it out the window. And then you know he gets to he gets to work, and then he finds out on the news that his house is burnt down because he left his stove on. Oh shit. And then his his boss won't let let him leave for work, so um he says um so I call, I um I quit, called my boss a jerk, punched him in the eye, and then it's like um. You know, he took myself and left pretty much, and then his job after that is him on Centrelink, and uh, he's and he's talking about how um he gets to sleep in every day and he wakes up whenever he likes, and then how he like um hardly ever needs to leave his room unless he needs to shit or piss or eat something because he doesn't want to miss Jerry Springer. <laughs> very very hussy. <laughs> yeah, so it's like I remember. Was that really, I, I love work? I love work. Yeah. All right. It's um. I think it was on the album Breakfast of Fat Boys or something like that, and that it's a very, very good song. And I know you had a couple more um, artists you wanted to quickly talk about. It. Any of them come to your mind right now, or...? Not the moment. Alright, if, if, if you can think of them later, we'll just double back quickly. Don't feel, don't feel bad, you're dropping me and just pulling it back. Um, and I just kind of... We mentioned at the end of the last segment that um, Soundwave kind of got stuck. Can you think of any other like major Australian concerts and how, how that helped? Well, now, can you think of how they differ from other countries? There's a Lane Wave Festival party in the paddock. That's more indie indie rock music, Australian music. Yeah, and then uh, there's also another one that's in uh, Queensland. I don't know if it goes anywhere else, but I know it's in uh, Queensland. Uh, Mud Balls and Music, which is a country music festival. Mud Balls and Music? Yeah. That's curious. So it's uh, full driving, radios, and country all in one place. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, and um, everyone there just gets pissed and just has a good time. Um, another uh, festival I can think of is uh, things like DEFCON 1. DEFCON 1. DEFCON. Uh, so that's like a hard style and techno festival. Yeah. But um, they have that overseas as well. Um, ours is not as big, but it's still everyone that goes to have a good time and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Um, do, do you feel our concerts are all more laid back, or, I don't, or, or do you think they're a bit more hectic? Because I know that you both have a bit of experience in mosh pits. They get a bit more intense, I would say. <laughs> and that's uh, we're very notorious for even the artists that say like, I want to see an Australian mosh pit. I want you to like, you know, give the like the American show the Americans what how it's done, and we'll tell like tell them back home how it's done. Like open up the circle pit, you know. Like that. Um, what sort of stuff? I went to Soundwave in 2014, and I um, caught the Five Finger Death Punch show which they're an American band and um, they were gonna they were gonna play a song and the singer was like I, I want to soak a bit and you know soak a bit started up and everything all was well and good so everyone goes to start playing and he's like no 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 I, like got everyone to stop and he's like I want to see a fucking Australian soak a bit <laughs> and I was standing on like the other side on uh, the other state like the other stage crowd because uh, Black Dahlia with Murder was gonna play next yeah and I was standing over there and all I just all I saw was the soak a bit open up and it just became fucking massive and he's like that's better now we can start <laughs> and um same thing happened uh we recently went to uh slipknot uh slipknot show um yeah. and lamb of god was playing and they ended on redneck and they were like yeah we want a soap pit for this song that and then you know soap pit started up he's like fuck that shit make it bigger i want an australian pit so i i feel like there's there is a tendency for bands to sort of um like, we are very much a country that's known for being hardcore because of, you know, where we live, 
and, you know, all the animals that are around us and the, the Aussie willingness to fight things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the actual like actual aggressiveness that mm. comes with like being a stereotypical Australian, I feel, definitely translates even, into like, even my experience, like non stereotypical Australians, we definitely have much, much more prominent um fight instinct. Yeah, we yeah, we like to we like to stand for what we believe in. Yeah. And I think we're very much raised to have that that strength in what we believe. Mm. And, uh, and that's good. As long as we don't, you know, take it too far and start wars over it. Yeah, and you know, um, yeah, I, I do do honestly believe that uh, like other overseas artists will come here and they when they come to an Australian show they're just like yeah fucking woo like Australia because just show show me your passion yeah, yeah. show me your heart yeah uh, so um that that'll bring us into our final well, our, our second to last segment. The price to tour Australia. Because um, I know you both have very strong feelings about this. So, um, Bird is Murder had an interview. Uh, it was like a 20 minute interview. And they um, the interviewer asked them, so how come you guys tour Europe and um, America so often, but not your home country as much? And he said it's like purely because it costs us like double or triple what a yeah. Europe tour costs us. And I think he said an Aussie tour on average would cost them like twenty or thirty grand for all of them, or like even higher. And whereas that would get them a full Europe tour of just so many venues, and they can expand more with that. And they're like, you know, a Europe Europe tour might cost them like ten grand. Whereas coming to Australia is because it's such a distance to fly and all yeah. that all that stuff. It's just a big hassle. For and I also, um, I'm not sure if I sent you guys the article, but there was an article by Richard Lee Jackson. It was, um... Yeah, I read that one. Yeah. So did you... Any thoughts or points you want to bring up from that, or...? I, like, I, I feel like I agree, like, in that article, it talks about every single expense, you need to think that out. Mm. And I think more so in Australia, because we get taxed a bot ton. Yeah. An absolute bot ton. We are the tax heaviest country in the world. Like, or one of. Mm. We're up there for the, the trinity of... You know, uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia. Yeah, but, uh, notorious for we're, it. we're nowhere near, you know, e even areas like Germany and Sweden mm -hmm. who get taxed, you know, si up to 60, 70%. I think ours max it out like 20, 30. Um, so we're, 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 we're up there among the, the main mm -hmm. trinity that you generally hear about they in Australia. Because yeah, yeah. we, we and Australians don't really hear about the rest of Europe, we mainly hear about England and America. So that's that's interesting. But, um, I believe you mentioned like early before the show that yeah, Australia to get to Australia it's very difficult. It's very much mm. a challenge and very costly. Well, we're, we're literally on the other side of the world to everyone else. It's, it's, and it's to do with our to, for our government as well. They're very conservative and they don't want to let people in. They're not we're, as a welcoming country as we are. The government's also responsible for how un, in, uninclusive we are mm. into bringing artists coming over. Like it costs so much to get like your visa well, and I, your um, expenses sorted. I know that when I, I went to England for two years fairly recently, um, my flight to England cost double my flight from England to America to stay in Disney World. Like adding on the prices from Disney World for two weeks, it still costs less than just going to England from Australia. And it's funny too, um, I, my parents and Madison and I, we went to um, Perth at the beginning of the year. and. Um, my mum and dad said, well, it's cheaper for us to fly, they were like, we'll go uh, Rockhampton to Brisbane, and then Brisbane to Perth, and then but on the way back, it is actually cheaper for us to go Perth to Bali to Brisbane. And they're like, so do you want to spend a couple of days in Bali because it's cheaper, and then we can get cheaper tickets as well. Like, we're in. We're I, in. I don't, I don't, it's stupid because you'd think, oh yeah, like direct from Perth to Brisbane. Cool, and then it's just like, no, both the Brisbane, oh, I'll, I'll, the Bali. Uh, our flights, for some reason, are very expensive. Getting to Australia and getting out of Australia in general is very expensive. And I know that that limits a lot of Australian bands early on, mm -hmm. because they can't get out of the country mm -hmm. to do those tours. That's like, with, like, because I'm from Tasmania, it's more expensive to fly from, so to Brisbane, from Brisbane you go to, to Sydney and then to Melbourne, and there's oodles of delays because of how like little the tourism industry is in Tasmania, how small it is. So it's more, it's cheaper for you to fly from 
from Sydney to Malaysia to China to Europe and back. But you know, you can go to Tasmania for the same price, it's fine. Oh, that's that's atrocious. That's yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty bad. Oh. So I could see why the appeal of going overseas and promoting yourself overseas would be yeah. so much so much cheaper. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, on the top of airlines, I know that Virgin Australia has recently announced that they're going to try and uh, try to be a, a bit of a a comrade to um, Australian musicians. Well, I feel I feel like that's like going to be great for um, Australians to get like more concerts and stuff because we are very limited with mm. festivals, like with festivals that go nationwide. Um, so I think a push for um, airlines to say to bands, hey look, you fly with us, we'll give you a hand, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a hand, we'll make it cheap, because it isn't cheap, but we'll, we'll try to take it down a bit, yeah. which I think that's awesome. Yeah, like, and, and, and just for those who are curious, um, the, the one thing I know for a fact they're doing is they've doubled the baggage load for anyone who comes on as a musician. So if you come on and you get a normal flight, you just say you're a musician and you're flying out for a show or whatever, and they'll double your baggage load for free. That's, there you that's go. insane. That's and that, that's, that's normally, like, that would normally cost you some uh, hundred, two hundred dollars yeah. off the top. So that's, that's a fantastic save. Um, are there any other points you guys want to mention of touring Australia? Uh, have you guys had any experience with, you know, uh, have you guys looked at any interviews of, of bands who've talked about it? Well, I know um, Parkway Drive, they, when they did their, like, early tours, um, they had a van that they used to have to roll start and a trailer. And the trailer was half gear for the shows, but it was also half surfboards at the top. So uh, they very much planned their tours around surf stops on the coast so that they could just have a good time, jump so bridges. They, they made sure that they were just seeing Australia as well as getting a bit of work done. Yeah, there. and um, they had a world tour for Atlas where they stopped over in Bali to play a show or two there. And the, <laughs> the place that their manager booked them in was a villa that was right on the beach because he was like, you guys aren't gonna wanna go surfing, like, whatever. That, that's just a long <laughs> And they, um, they they didn't know where they were staying and they, they walked into like this this house and they were like, oh yes. And then um, lead singer like turned to the cameras and sort of documentary and he's just like, just another fucking day at work. like. Whatever. <laughs> mm. yeah. Alright, and, and we'll finally move into the, the final segment, which is the, the personal reflection. You know, it's the same in every episode. Um, but Jake, do, did you want to try and get your, your music set up while I quickly talk for Madison, or did you want to just push that off until the end? No, oh, I'll just I'll push that to the end. Alright, fair enough. Um, so, I, I just want to quickly address that you're, you're quite into the metal scene yourself. Um, Madison, you mentioned that you've not quite got that, that for a well, You've got a very big variety of music interested in. Can, can you give us a couple of your, your favourite songs or singers at the moment? At the moment? Hmm. Just, just the first ones that come to your head or...? Uh, I've sort of been into like a... They don't have to be Australian. Yeah, it's a good, like a, like a electronic artist called Odeza, I believe it's called. Odeza. Odeza. I'll, I'll get you to help me spell that after the... <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, what else have I been into? I've been into a bit of um, still still piano as well. Mm. Just like I enjoy light-hearted music, just catchy music. But at the same time, I feel like the pop genre it's a bit too recycled and a bit too uh, like, too much for me and to listen to. Th so there's I, not there's not enough different voices. Yeah, there. for sure. What else have been listening to? I, I know that you are. You mentioned a large number of Sia songs. Do you, do you particularly enjoy Sia or? I do, I do like Sia, I like strong singers, I also like Florence and the Machine. Ah, Florence and the Machine. We, we, we have a, a shared passion there. Definitely a powerhouse voice. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I know I went and saw Maria and the Diamonds while I was in England. Oh, was she good? Yeah, she was fantastic, like, absolutely fantastic. Nice. I like her as well, she's lovely. Yeah, she is. Um, Alright, and, and we'll go back to you, Jake. You've mentioned so many favourite bands. I want you to give me your top three big ones. Top three. Ma match Madison for numbers. Alright, um, definitely your friend Annihilator. Yeah, okay. Yep, um, favorite songs like by them would, you know, be like Embryonic Fetish, So the Stillborn, um, Blasphemian, um, 
I'll, I'll include a link to their uh, to their YouTube channel if I can find it down below. I am not including links to specific songs, <laughs> and I'm going to give you the caveat that they are very brutal. Uh, Jake showed me some of these songs uh, before we did the <laughs> podcast, and I was I was blown away. <laughs> and it takes a lot to get to me. It's pretty great. Um, I have to say, uh, one album that I've been listening to quite a lot recently is um, Tool's album Ten Thousand Days. Um, they're very different band, but um, like that's like the album's from like a little bit, little while ago, but still, still holds up today. It's pretty good. Um, another band that I would have to say, I found a band. I think it was like early this year, or late last year, uh, called The Browning. They're an American band, but they mix sort of techno and metal, and it's quite an interesting combination. And I like that. And cool. Just, just a more medicine. And, and what? And just, and corn. Just a one of those. Right, I'm not including that down there, Blair. I'm not, not letting him do it. Not letting him do it. <laughs> Alright. And, uh, so I know that you mentioned before that you've uh, been playing for six years, and I know that for a while that you were looking for a band to join. Um, what, what were the barriers to entry? Just just finding a band and getting that, that behind you? Well, like, I'm part of a band now, but we haven't really sort of gotten together to really do anything. Uh, can you give me the name of the band? Uh, forget me not. Forget me not. Like, um, but I think it's just for a band. You have to just find like if anyone's trying to get into a band or anything, you just have to find people with the same tastes and just uh, it's, it's a lot of commitment. Yeah, it, it is a lot of commitment. It's gonna take a long time before you start getting any amount of money from it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. and um, like one of my friends, he's. Um, starting, he's been in a band for a little while now, um, and they're, uh, well, they changed their name recently to uh, No Intel uh, no Intelligent Life, or Nil. Nil Intelligent Life. Yeah. And um, they uh, put out a song called Brain Fog, and it was very catchy, very good, but um, I think they just sort of uh, recorded through like a friend of theirs, and just they've put it up, so I think just to sort of get into the industry, you just have to build up that big exposure first. Um, Aussie band Capture the Crown, um, they had, I think they had like a, they had one YouTube video, like of, like a music video of them for, I think it was like three years, and then it, it just amassed like this uh, incredible amount of music, it was like seven million or something, and everyone's like, come on guys, like, when the fuck are you bringing an album out? And they ended up putting an album out in like 2012 called Till Death, and um, that was a that was a solid album, and they brought out another one in 2014 called Reign of Terror, and that was it's sort of like Arsenal Alexandria, but it's more you know Australia meets Arsenal Alexandria. Yeah, yeah, which it was it was it was nice. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, Madison, have you ever have you found there's any barriers in getting into the scenes in general? Because I know that you're you've not really dedicated yourself to any one scene. So when you started going into a uh, heavy music scene with uh, Jake, did you find any? Any barriers, any judgment, any... There's definitely no judgment. I just feel like there's defi it's definitely a lot of word of mouth. It's definitely definitely social media and definitely that word of mouth. It's not particular. It's not particularly... With small bands, it's not promotions because if you see, you know, a poster sit on the street, it's going to be next to 50 others. Mm. So it's more word, word of mouth how it was back in the 70s and 80s. So they'd hand out flyers and you take the flyer and it's like, oh, have you heard about this band coming up in... This pub, and you'd go see them because they're like, "Oh, it's a Friday night. Why not?" Mm. It's definitely word of mouth, and it's definitely how how it's still happening. And it's I think it's a, it's good, especially for local bands to become bigger to have that word of mouth. Yeah. And on social media platforms, it's definitely better than any sort of any sort of media. Yeah. All right. And this this wasn't originally meant to come into the uh, fun segment, but I forgot to bring this up. Um, Pirating of music, I know that you really wanted to talk about that. How do you feel that's affected the industry? It, it hasn't, in my opinion. It hasn't at all. I feel like it's misconstrued in how they want to profit off this, off the people that have downloaded certain albums and certain content. But the thing is, if someone downloads your, con your content illegally, they want to know what you have to offer them. Say, I say I don't want to pay twenty dollars for this album. I want to, but I still want to listen to it. Sure, I'm gonna borrow off my friend, or I'm gonna illegally download it. Then I'm gonna listen to it. 
really like this album. I'm going to go buy the CD, I'm going to go buy the merchandise, I'm going to go to the concert. And then I'm going to buy more merchandise while I'm there, and I'm going to spend money on a hotel, on little businesses, on a trip. And that equals money for everyone. So no one really loses out, I feel, at um, all. Do, do you mirror this thought, Jake? Do you, do you fall in the same category? Uh, not really. Like, I feel like pirating music I think that's why Spotify and Apple Music have gotten so big because of, you know the streaming service. You pay a fee a month and you can listen to. Uh, Spotify is actually just. Spotify is free, but you get like more skips and you can play songs for that. Yeah. Spotify has a bit of a uh, a bad name lately for how they handle their interactions with us. Thing is, what I'm saying. I was going to say this little little trivia for you. I believe it's Nelly, the artist. He's currently, I think, he's filing back from bankruptcy, but everyone on the internet they're collaborating together to, to play it's hot in here by nelly on spotify over i think it's six million times it needs to be played so he can make enough money to not be broke anymore so it's a little 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 thing a little bit of community so it's backing. definitely still money towards the artist for sure but at yeah. the same time it's still a streaming service where you pay such a minuscule amount for all of that all of the songs and um i just want to add i feel like um the music industry now because of uh, with people pirating music, the way that bands are sort of adapted to that is when they um, start recording an album, you'll see on their Facebook, their Twitter, they'll be like, okay, look guys, new album's coming out, these are the dates, blah, 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 and they'll usually release a teaser and be like, hey, like, here's, like, here's a song that will sort of set the basis for the album. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like um, bands nowadays sort of have to they have to grab your expectations quite early for you to commit to buying it. Mm. See, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because um, I know the majority of my friends lately, um, when they've bought CDs, it's been, it's been a band that they've not been able to afford to buy the product sales for multiple years. Yeah. And a, a lot of the time they'll, um, they'll download it prematurely just to make sure they have access to it before they can afford to, to really do yeah. it. So th there is uh, something worth talking about there of fans using it as a way to just get a hold of music. But what I'm finding interesting, um, and I'm noticing this more and more, is that bands are starting to set up their own YouTube channels to, and, and they get the ad yeah, yeah. revenue from the YouTube channel, and they yeah. put their their products out there through YouTube yeah. that. I also believe that that's another thing that they've sort of had to adapt to. Like, you know, YouTube coming out in 2005, that was a big thing. Mm. And, I mean, people would upload um, songs of bands with, like, shittily edited movie maker like lyrics on top of it with the, the stock black and white background because lyrics videos yeah because they were like I don't know how to fucking use movie maker blue and white <laughs> and you know that's what happens and I feel like bands would have been like well instead of other people putting out content on there why why don't we just have our own official channel mm. um, and then you know they used they used to have like official like next to their band name or whatever and then they upload all their own videos and, and now they've got um like da 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 vivo vivo yeah like exactly that, so. yeah but um I, I definitely I think in all honesty in my personal opinion because I want to throw that out there as well so I think that YouTube has really helped artists try and spread their yeah oh definitely like, it, it's, I, I think the advent of the internet and how we've ha we've been forced to adapt I think that. The new ways of getting it out there is so much more helpful when you really have something you want to say and you really have a voice you want to put out there. You just need to make sure that you're putting it out on multiple media. So you can't just put it up on YouTube and wait. You have to put it up on YouTube, maybe put a Tumblr post up there or a Twitter post, go on Facebook, make, make sure it gets out there and seen. And that's mm. my personal piece of advice as, as a journalist would definitely just be make sure you put out as much as you can for people to see and, and get a hold of your content. Yeah, like... And um, you may not get paid for it at first, but that advertising alone is it invaluable. In yeah. Mm. yeah. Free advertising is always invaluable. You exactly. always find exactly. that. Yeah. Um, I feel like the internet helps and also hinders at the same time when yeah. it comes to advertising and releasing new albums. So artists, sometimes they just drop surprise albums rather than saying, oh guys, we have an album, because sometimes they get hacked and their music gets leaked months early. Like, until it's the actual release date. I, I think a big part of that is you just need to know how to own it with, with social media. You need to really know how to get in there. It's mm -hmm. like um, uh, Bring Me the Horizon when they were uh, releasing Semi Eternal. I think that got leaked on to Kickstarters, 
think it was like three or six months early. Like, sorry, it was very early, and that wasn't that wasn't a shit quality upload either. That was like the actual. It was like it sounded like it was such high quality. Everyone was like, "This, this can't be like it," and it was. Yeah. Uh, then there's like some bands like I think Infinite Annihilator. Their their latest album got leaked. I think it was like two three days early, and in response to that, they were just like, "Look." We're not really too mad that it got leaked earlier, that, and then they just uploaded it to their own channel. And they're yeah. like, so we decided why not upload it in high def and with lyrics. So it was pretty much like screw you to the guy that uploaded it. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely <laughs> the right way to handle yeah, it. It's just those yeah. months. Yeah. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's episode. Except that Jake would like to play a song. Yeah. It, oh, I just have to ask, how can people get in touch with you, or do you want them to just go through me? I just. Just get get that get that shank and just this guy. Uh, okay, so we, we now have a your unique something Facebook page that I'll be linking down in the description, um, and hopefully this Sunday I'll be setting up a uh, Twitter for this podcast and be able to get out there from there. Sounds good. Yeah. And um, in the future I'll be putting things on SoundCloud and I might put stuff up for download just so people can take it with them. Uh, we'll see how I can get that set up. Rad. But in the meantime, Jake, did you want to? Uh, and, and I'll make sure that I give I give you a room, so... Hi, it's Skadoodle. I will move myself. Th this way he just has a bit of, a bit of space to play. Mm -hmm. Alright, do you want to uh, tell us anything about your guitar, by the way? Um, so... Lovely beast of thing. Uh, it's not really, not really a lovely beast. It's alright for what it is. It's a... Uh, Anyone curious, it's an Ibanez S Series 7 string. Um, I have the locking tuners off it because, I don't know, I just do. Because I think, like, the top one's fucked anyway. Like, it just doesn't screw in properly or anything, so I was like, yeah, I'll just take a walk off, why not? Alright, so I'm just gonna um, quickly throw out that again. I apologize for my quality this week. It will be better, I promise. It's going to get better. It's not the guitar that makes me sound good, it's the amp that makes me sound good. Today we're going to play Druid Sandstorm. Oh yeah, what, what song are you playing today? Druid Sandstorm. Um, so, just to sort of get like a different sort of view of stuff I play, I guess. Um, what are you doing, Amp? Okay. <laughs> um, so, I'm just going to sort of play just stuff, I'm just going to find a tone there, just... Alright. Alright. So it's just sort of like a... I don't know what you'd really call it. Just a... a G. An overview. Mm. Uh, so it won't be like full songs or anything, but just sort of... Okay. Just, just, just a quick little bit. Yeah. Just, just to show off what he's capable of. Yeah. And when, when, if your band ever does get together and put out a song, tell me and I'll bring you guys on. Alright, no worries. Uh, so... First up, I'll do like the intro to Painkiller by Judas Priest, so that's just a. <laughs> by Suicide Silence. Very fucking basic song. Um... Well, so then you have like your classics like Master of Puppets or Metallica.
idea. Well, if, 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 if you want to, we can end that there. Yeah. I think you've done an admirable job so far, so... Right, you guys both happy with how the sound podcast went? Yeah, it went yeah. pretty well. Alright, well, I'll include a link down below to the uh, Your Unique Something Facebook page. If you guys have any questions or have any topics you guys might want these two to come back and cover, anything at all, uh, send me a message and I'll pass along to them. Thanks for joining us and have a nice evening.